One of the things that annotation is most related to, you know, annotation is, um, you know, something that we do, you know, in the margins uh, or in the context of something else. And uh, one of its applications that's most, you know, kind of useful for all of us is, you know, the more personal aspect of taking notes um, with as, as a part of an overall kind of personal knowledge management strategy or practice. So this year, for I annotate partly as a as a kind of a reaction to the kind of absolute explosion of innovation in the note taking area that's that's happened over the last uh, three four or five years um, is to do a uh, a whole kind of a dedicated track or def- dedicated session on note taking and kind of the intersection of note taking and annotation and where it's all headed. I am super flattered um, to have a kind of an extraordinary panel with us. Before I introduce them, let me just kind of give give the, the, the basic why here, um, which is that, uh, you know, note taking it is an, an intensely personal and sticky thing, sticky in the sense that, you know, once you start using a certain system or a certain practice, um, you're likely to stick with it for, for a very long time. And so ch- choosing becomes really important. Um, and, and also because of the way that these systems are designed and the choices that they make um, in terms of how they encode and store information, um, the design of, of these apps is super important because it really shapes how we think. So thinking about thinking and thinking about note-taking applications becomes um, something that it might make sense to, to do. So that's the purpose of uh, the session here today. Um, and I want to um, go ahead and introduce um, our speakers. So Ward, uh, many here will know, uh, Ward Cunningham, who's the founder of Wikipedia, along with Jimmy Wales, uh, and, and who really innovated in, uh, m- much of that system, where I think wrote mo- most of the original code, um, and invented a lot of things. But primary among them for us today um, are a couple of things. One is um, the notion of kind of creating pages into existence simply by naming them uh, and and simultaneously linking them. Uh, it's my, maybe something he'll, he'll chat about if he has a moment, um, which is really a phenomenally important insight that many of the apps here have adopted uh, as a strategy and as kind of a, a feature of a, of a lot of uh, the way that these kind of modern uh, wiki linking apps work. Um, and also the uh, concept of automatic backlinking, um, which is another feature that, that is kind of omnipresent in, in the space. Um, Daniel Doyon uh, is the founder of Readwise, um, which has quickly become the kind of universal glue um, that links all the apps at what I call the edge um, to the apps um, that folks use to map different topics together. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's probably one of the most used apps we see here with Hypothesis in terms of how people are, are using our what we build with other folks. Uh, Eduardo um, is a... a an engineer at Google who's created the Agora, uh, which is an open source federated note-taking platform, which um, really implements a lot of interesting and cool things that have to do with how you might collaborate on building your personal knowledge management system with others. Um, Bastion is the lead developer and maintainer of org mode, um, which many here will recognize as as the mode inside of Emacs that really jump-started a, a, a note-taking revolution in the early 2000s um, of uh, kind of extremely efficient um, note-taking and organization um, that, uh, that has become a model for a lot of how the other apps that have followed have kind of worked. Um, Oliver is a kind of the, the renegade uh, counterculture open source um, and privacy guy here, uh, whose World Brains Memex project is beloved um, by many for how its approach um, to, that they've taken in terms of how you can store and archive and annotate the web as you travel around it. 
and uh, Connor. Um, uh, Connor is uh, perhaps uh, revolutionized this space more recently, more than kind of any other single uh, service with the creation of Rome, which is used by uh, tons of folks. I'm super excited to hear what he has to say about where they're headed. Um, and Junio, who um, is one of the key team members at the LOCSEC project, which is, although they're a relative newcomer, um, are implementing and kind of ticking some of the key boxes that people want to see in these kind of apps, um, maybe more effectively than, than almost uh, any other kind of, of, of the, the relative newcomers. So um, super thrilled to have all of them here today. And um, we're gonna go ahead and jumpstart folks in this order. So I will go ahead and, and what we're gonna do here is we're gonna do a series of lightning talks, you know, kind of five to seven minutes um, on, on their kind of vision for where things are headed. Uh, we may have room for time for, you know, kind of a question or two after each one, um, but we'll wanna move relatively quickly through all of them and then get to a panel discussion, which will follow this in which it'd be more of a kind of a freewheeling uh, discussion with plenty of time for audience participation. So without further ado, let me kick it over to Ward. So I, uh, uh, you know, I get going and I have trouble stopping. So I, I thought I'd kind of follow uh, the outline Dan sent. And uh, there's plenty of room in that to uh, say useful things. Uh, you know, he, he asked what are the trends that I see and, and of course, Trends on the internet are not very positive right now. There's a lot that has gone wrong. Uh, you know, in the 90s, we all thought that it was the savior, and it turns out to be the destroyer in many ways. And I think that really is the advertising model. Advertising being just a structured form of lying, really. And, and uh, you know, uh, I, I'd say don't trust anything you care about to somebody else with a business model because their business model isn't to make you successful. Uh, I also sometimes call it clear cutting of the internet, you know, and that seems to get it emotionally. I think I tried to replace some of my familiar jargon with metaphors and that's one I like. Uh, you know, the, the, the other thing I like is uh, that some of us, maybe it's an old timer thing, are seeking a quiet place to, uh, to listen to the wind in the trees, that subtle thing that, you know, inspires, might take some practice, uh, curiosity to, to hear that. I, I use that to talk about some development practices that are, could be called listening to the wind in the trees and, and responding. You know, on the internet, I think it's, it's, it's making a space that is more like a park than a shopping mall. And uh, I'm not, I, I think my colleagues here probably, you know, are park builders too. My particular vision, you know, is, is uh, I wanted to make something that was federated, but still recognizably a wiki. And a wiki has never been federated. Usually there's one big database and everybody shares it. So I just said, well, you know, if we want to have small sites that don't get ravaged, uh, maybe everybody brings their own site. And uh, this was at a time where you could say node install a wiki and have a wiki. And, and you know, it, the internet has gotten more difficult than that. Uh, and we could talk about why it's gotten so difficult. But, uh, but I'll say the, the idea was that uh, uh, I call it profligate copying. In other words, you're expected to copy. You're not successful if you're not being copied. And I think there's a lot of places in the world where, you know, impact in the world is when your ideas spread and they spread by other people having your ideas. And maybe, maybe after a while they forget you were your ideas, but, you know, you know, if you can't charge money for them, then who cares if, you know, the success is spreading those ideas. And that's a foundation of creativity really is, is understanding other ideas and then taking them and making them your own. Uh, sometimes we'll call that the, the chorus of voices. 
is a little different than GitHub, where you want to have a bunch of people contributing to a piece of code where there's one correct piece of code in the end. And and here, here we're thinking, you know, there is this sort of fork capability. And we use the word fork because it means you're taking it. Uh, but we I'll talk about a chorus of voices where where uh, nobody has to be saying the same thing or at the same time, but that it somehow comes together and makes something uh, probably improvisational more than anything. Uh, but uh, that that is that's what we seek. And it turns out that a lot of it looks like note taking. You know, people have mentioned that, you know, about the time you have a thousand pages, you're ready to start a conversation because something will come up and they say, wait a second, I got a page on that. And then you pull that page out and maybe share it and talk about how it's different in the current context. But that's, that's a body of work. And it might not be all pages you wrote. It might be pages you found other people and just put a little bit of your own spice on them. The, the other thing that I think has emerged to be really important is, is we, we, we talk about kind of shaping the white space around ideas that that uh, this is you know like improvisational musicians talk about free space or sometimes white space or poets talk about having a place to create a place in their mind to create and that that's a little bit different than remembering things it's really it's truly trying to move things over side so that you can think of something new and doing that collaboratively is pretty amazing. The the uh, uh, the, the other thing that it's been at the heart of what we've done in the last ten years is is uh, mixed content on a page. You know that uh, we have a markup, but we never made a universal markup. In fact, the most common markup is just simply plain text and hyperlinks. So the double square brackets is about what you get there. But, you know, when you're just talking, that's pretty nice. But we can do uh, lots of other kinds of formats. And we kind of lean to the more complicated things like map markers and, and, and uh, uh, knowledge graphs and uh, uh, data, data, representational data in various forms. And what we like to say is if you really have something you want to get done, instead of doing it somewhere else and talking about it in Wiki, Maybe you can do it in a wiki and share your setups. You know, uh, if you've got an electron microscope hooked up, you know, maybe they're pretty ornery. And if you take some great pictures with it, maybe you set it up with a wiki page and share that wiki page with the colleagues across the world. Could be um, interesting. How am I doing time wise? Did I run out? Uh, rapid, uh, another minute. Uh, another minute. OK, well, I've got a minute and a half worth of stuff here. Uh, one thing that, that, that's come out of that idea is, first of all, when you own your own server, you can pretty much hook whatever you want to it. Uh, we've started writing multiple servers, different you know, implementations of editors, and these get called the outpost. The mo model is that you could have a place in Antarctica, and it's not very pleasant, but you can do things there you can't do anywhere else, and you don't cut off every connection with the real world when you're down in Antarctica. You know, one of the things that that that's, that's done for us is really freed us to think uh, 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 of the future in a very positive way. One thing I should mention about annotations is that our pages are a little problematic in that they don't have a specific home. They float around the Internet. Uh, they have a history, but they don't have a home. What we've done with annotations recently is add uh, descriptions of intention. You know, this is this this is a little line that says, when you're here, you can push this thing and this will happen. And that intention is independently evaluated by what I might have called the testing system a few days ago. Now I call it the robot critic. And that robot critic is an outpost that might be reading what you write. Maybe there's several of them and it's commenting back in the Federation about whether what you say happens, happens or not. And this allows us to grow the system. You know, in another world, you'd call them unit tests or func integrated functional tests is what I called them before. But now I think they're annotated intention 
And the conversation around these annotations is just a conversation with you and another robot that might be a little more like the check engine light in your car than anything uh, artificially intelligent, but still very reliable. And that's our path forward. So thanks for the time. And I hope I conveyed the feeling of what we're doing as much as how we do it. Lord, thank you so much. Um, Daniel, you're up. Nice to meet everyone. My name is Daniel Doyan, and I'm one of the two founders of a small tool called Readwise. Um, it's still pretty small, and most people haven't heard of it, so I'll just give a quick overview of what it does, um, just for context. Um, but we started working on this back in 2017, and we were really focused on the mission of using software to improve the practice of reading, which is a pretty grand mission, and to make that a little bit more uh, immediately actionable, we noticed that um, all these readers like us who used Kindle or who used um, Read It Later services like Instapaper or Pocket, uh, most of these people had accumulated this very high quality data in the form of highlights and notes and annotations while they were reading. But very few people, like maybe less than 5% of the people who were reading in this way, actually had a, a way to go back and revisit those highlights and make use of them. Um, so that's really the origin of Readwise is we um, developed a somewhat novel workflow to go and get your highlight data, which isn't so easy to get with most of these services. And then once we had it, uh, we would just make, make it easy for you to consistently review uh, those highlights. And, and we do that in many different ways from a daily email, which is kind of the uh, easiest and most consistent, kind of like lowest engagement all the way through a web app and mobile app. Um, and people immediately enjoyed this because, like I said, they'd already curated this really high signal, high quality data for themselves uh, while reading. And going back and, and revisiting that content is, is pleasurable and it, it may create the opportunity to take action or it may spark a connection or you may use it as a writing prompt. Um, and Peter Pool immediately resonated with that. Um, so from there, in order to expand that value prop, um, we started with Amazon Kindle. Kindle obviously has uh, a huge monopoly share of um, the ebook space, you know, something over 90%. Um, so most uh, book highlights were coming out of Kindle, but we started to support uh, the, the so-called long tail of reading apps. So we'd add Apple Books, which makes it really hard to get them out, Google Play Books, uh, Instapaper, Pocket, PDFs, Medium, and a cadre of other sources. Um, so then our value prop kind of evolved into uh, being a place that makes it easy to get all your reading data and annotations into a single place. And once we did that, then probably most interesting for the folks here because uh, most people who, you know, for example, know what Rome is um, are like the, the very elite power users you know, they're, they're not really interested in our um, kind of simple, easy daily habit, but would rather get those highlights that we've liberated and bring them into a place like Rome where they can do even more powerful stuff. So we've also built uh, a series of export integrations to complement the import uh, integrations. And we've become kind of like a very, very tiny Zapier of like reading data. Um, so that's, that's kind of the background on Readwise and what it is, um, you know, what what we're focused on long term is, um, you know, we have this belief that when the personal computer originally came out, it immediately was better for writing than anything that existed before analog. It was better than typewriters, it was better than writing by hand. So everyone's heard the phrase software is in the world and software immediately ate the practice of writing. Uh, you know, which obviously includes note taking. Uh, what software didn't immediately eat was reading because reading on a desktop computer, you know, on one of those, you know, small, low resolution CRT monitors, like that was not a better experience than just reading an ordinary book or reading a, a printed out research paper or something. Okay, but technology is finally caught up and we now have the devices, for example, e-ink, tablets, you know, normal tablets, smartphones, where you can now consume content much better on a computing device. 
Um, so it's just a matter of time until a new category of software is created, which is essentially the analog of the word processor, but for reading. Um, and that's very much what we're focused on, um, you know, helping to innovate. There's obviously going to be a whole ecosystem around that space, but, th but that's the place that we're interested in playing. Um, you know, helping to create software that doesn't cater to the mass market, you know, people who are reading fiction or romance novels, but instead people who are reading with a purpose, uh, creating that, that productivity elite software. Thanks, Daniel. Oh, thank you very much, Dan. And uh, it's a pleasure being here and an honor in this, uh, uh, this company. Uh, so I'll try to be short, which is not one of my strengths. Uh, <laughs> so uh, please excuse any, any discomfort. And I'm starting a timer. Uh, yes. So uh, Anagora, uh, this is the project that uh, brings me here. And I will try to um, like uh, share some light on this and hopefully um, like uh, see if it can be useful to others, which is our intention. So first of all, what is Anagora? Um, so we're going to be using um, uh, different definitions throughout uh, this short deck uh, at different uh, layers of abstraction or levels of abstraction, I guess. But um, it, it, in its uh, first definition, I will say that Anagora is a crowdsourced distributed knowledge graph. In particular, as it is currently, as you will see, uh, it is a knowledge graph that is assembled uh, or you will say integrated out of uh, volunteer data. Entity mapped is all we request, which means each resource is uh, explicitly about, about something, right? Um, and in particular, of course, we have started with, uh, as, as many of you may know, uh, with a corpus of notes, just uh, notes that people are taking in diverse tools. And uh, we are uh, trying to extend that to uh, annotations. Um, and Agora is also a social network in a sense, uh, perhaps, yeah, because um, the knowledge graph that we are building uh, or that we can build uh, both um, is, I mean, contains knowledge produced in a social context, like all knowledge. And in particular, uh, very often this knowledge is about people. So uh, you could say that the knowledge graph contains a social graph, and that is probably true of many tools in this space, right? And uh, more generally, perhaps, uh, and now it's a public space. This is our inspiration, right? Um, and and uh, here I would just say for now that it is not a market, but a commons. Right? So a, a bit about our vision here, which is uh, when I say our, uh, I believe I say, uh, you know, uh, belonging to us all. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, perhaps this will be a bit um, obvious to someone else, but he goes. Um, the vision is that the social knowledge space, the space we are in, needs an integration layer or an interlay uh, that can be managed as a commons by communities. Um, so we call it the Agora for short. The name isn't important. I actually believe our implementation, very humble, uh, may not be important either, but I believe the concept is useful. So here goes. Um, I think we are all here in a in, in, in an nexus to some extent, or in the continuity, and we face a unique opportunity as, as communities because uh, to some extent we are part of the community sometimes, and uh, it is the right time to uh, step up as a group and invest in interop, resist vendor locking, and uh, try to agree on solutions that uh, uh, essentially uh, keep us away from centralized systems, right, that we know have uh, limitations. Uh, and uh, to minimize this, uh, I, I, we believe, the ones uh, working on the Agora for now, that we want to keep the cost of inter low, as low as we can. So from this all, uh, a few design principles for the Agora uh, stem, uh, and that will be that uh, the Agora uh, should be free and open source, and it is. And the Agora should require little of integrators and try to give back plenty. And the Agora should try to make use of existing conventions, which to some extent is, it, it, it can be derived from the, from the second point. OK, so this is, um, uh, I guess, uh, relatively nice. Let me actually, um, OK, I hope you can see this. Um, so uh, this is really, really nice, but going to, towards the concrete, how does it actually work? So we have our, our reference Agora. 
and it is built around a few just a few common building blocks so we have uh, nodes repositories uh, as the initial copra we have the wiki link as the one integration primitive we are depending on and we have a set of optional conventions that we can add to this and using this we assemble uh, essentially uh, these nodes annotations in alpha and also social media activity uh, like which is being tested into this social wiki-like construct. So you can see an example here on the right. Um, the idea here is that all resources that map to the same wiki link, so to the same entity, because in the Agora, the wiki link describes an entity, uh, they are all uh, attached to the same node in this knowledge graph. Uh, and the Agora, the, the, the Agora overlay that we have that is uh, uh, shown to the right, presents them sequ sequentially, essentially as a sort of like sequential wiki, and then try to integrate them in the context, so essentially uh, show connectivity like uh, at the bottom and, and elsewhere in the Agora uh, as a group. Um, so we are also like uh, trying to develop some uh, some features that uh, perhaps um, can remind you of like essentially a social network. We're very inspired by the uh, internet around the year 2000, I like to say, and wikis are a big part of this also a journaling uh, movement and uh, everything to blogging, etc. And of course, also like uh, the contemporary projects that um, uh, we have heard of here. And um, we are trying essentially to build uh, a commons. Let me just keep, a, keep ahead because I'm a bit short on time. Just for the basics, which is like how to, how to join to the Agora. Okay. Um, the, um, it's a, it is a, a three-step process, right? The TLDR is, you can take notes with any tool, with your prefer preferred tool, and then optionally submit your notes to the Agora. The Agora tries to be completely detached from any of these um, uh, implementation specific details. For this, we currently have like a default setup, which means um, essentially markdown notes with wiki links as an extension. The only extension we require, uh, actually not, do not require, but make use of. Make use of. And uh, Git as the essentially uh, underlay in project underlay, uh, under, underlay terms, as well as the you know platform to host uh, your uh, the, the corpuses, right? The corpora. Uh, after you take notes and you can use you know as I say any tool, um, and after publishing them to Git, you can let an Agora know, and the Agora will just keep pulling your notes uh, while they're available. So you keep control of your data, which is definitely like one of our design principles. Uh, and here, uh, okay, so sh just, I guess, shortly late, I have, uh, this is the end of the Angling talk. There's much we can cover, but uh, of course, first of all, thank you for listening. Uh, there are pointers here. You can jump to these slides by uh, using the Go link, Go Agora slides in the Agora, or of course, explore at your own pace. Um, we have uh, features that we believe could be used for, of use to the community, which is sort of the intent uh, behind the Agora to, uh, you know, uh, require little, and try to give back at no cost. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, yeah, please also let us know if you have any questions. Uh, you can reach out to me or any of the members of the Flancia Collective. And thank you very much. Eduardo, we have one question specifically for you, which is how do you, uh, from uh, Robert um, Hayesfield, um, how do you approach the problem of people using different words to describe the same concept? Yes, uh, this is a very interesting question, which, uh, of course, yeah. So the short of it is that we try to not be opinionated about exactly how you do this, but rather instead experiment with um, what we call, uh, well, agro actions in this case uh, is, uh, have to do with this, which is experiment with um, atomic or uh, basic concepts that could be used to uh, eventually reach uh, consensus on, uh, you know, canonical entities, uh, equivalence, uh, and you know, other interesting semantic relationships on a social level. So, so basically, we, we try to. Be, the, the idea here is to build this uh, sort of meaning without imposing, like, uh, you know, a cost uh, when it comes to like applying a schema. Or a particular um, a particular way of doing this. Uh, so essentially, or shortly, we don't we are we, we actually don't do this now, but rather give users tools to optionally do this according to different standards. Great. Um, Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for having me and for inviting me. It's really exciting uh, to meet these people that have been following your work uh, for a long time. I'll try to be short to be able to enjoy the conversation. So I'm Bastien Gary and um, I'm the maintainer for Emacs Org Mode. Uh, as it said, uh, I would like to go back to uh, classics uh, and 2015. Five centuries ago, we had Socrates' criticism of written culture, saying that uh, notes and writings come with forgetfulness. Uh, words, written words, are just dead passive expressions of thoughts, and uh, the people who express these thoughts cannot reply. They are not here uh, to claim authorship, authorship for what I said. Uh, so thoughts, written thoughts are like uh, orphans. So it was a very strong criticism. And the paradox is that uh, his student, Plato, has been writing. Uh, he has been writing dialogues uh, famously. And these dialogues are about real persons discussing about something. Uh, they do interact live, thinking out loud, and the output of these conversations is not new information, actually. It's uh, all about unlearning what uh, the persons believe they knew. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but it's always interesting to think about these two philosophers. One who said there is a danger uh, in notes and written words and written culture, that we are completely surrounded with uh, today. And the other one, uh, the students who use writing as a way to convey uh, not just information, but a way of thinking and a way of, uh, of, of interacting with uh, oneself. So uh, f just starting from this, I define uh, notes with a purpose. Uh, so words, written words, are like a pharmacon. They are both a remedy and a poison. Uh, and I, I get from, the, from that this definition of good note-taking tools. They help us fighting forgetfulness by stimulating thoughts with contextualized information about the who, the what, and the why. So this is very general, but I think it's uh, still helpful to guide us into thinking what, uh, what we should do about the tools that we are shaping and uh, writing. And good digital note-taking tools, they easily blend into online conversation. So I'm really glad I heard this word of conversation uh, by, uh, um, uh, in previous discussion by Ward Cunningham, because I think that's really key here into designing the, the thing we are working on. So uh, we have models and anti-model. Uh, the anti-model is the word document floating around with no versioning, no tracking of authors, and no easy sharing, and most of the time with no context. And I have three models. One is MediaWiki, with pages and discussions and history and authorship and all what you need to get credit for what you write and get the context about what you write. The, the second model is email-driven Git workflow uh, with versioning and authorship and also this same plain text format for having conversations about what you do and the same plain text format for patches that you contribute uh, when you write code. And the other model is uh, blogs and RSS feeds. I think all the three models are really conversations and that I, I think good uh, digital note-taking tools are really uh, going towards. I will just take one minute uh, to present Orgmod. I think this is not really the purpose of this conversation, and uh, I invite people to discover it. So this is an Orgmod file, plain text uh, with some formatting. Um, the main... Um, so Orgmod motto is about your life in plain text. Uh, it's a, a personal information manager, uh, authored by Carsten Dominic, like sometimes like uh, 18 years ago already. 
uh, plain text format similar in spirit to Markdown, a set uh, of tools to manipulate these org files, mostly accessible from within GNU Emacs, but not only. I think there are some modules in, in VS Code, for example. It's a free software, so it's published under the GPL3 or later, and it's standing of, uh, on the shoulders of uh, Emacs. And this is really the, the engine for every org mode feature. Also, because, if, because it's free software, uh, most of the features have been designing have been designed, uh, uh, not implemented by, but proposed and designed by the users. And I think that was key by on, on starting a useful tool is to have the feedback of users and to be guided about what they really need. And the single powerful idea that Kasten started with was uh, usually you had tools for to-do items and task management and tools for note taking. And he completely uh, uh, refused this, this distinction and said, we need one tool, one from the same tool for note taking and to-do items. <laughs> so the features that we have is this minimal syntax that I've been talking about. Folding is at the core of org mode since the last 20 years, uh, 18 years, but folding was already present in Emacs. Uh, org mode made folding for the people. Uh, restructuring. Uh, restructuring, changing the structure of the document should be as pleasant as editing text. And I think that's still key in every note-taking document. And we are very uh, passionate about this. Perspe perspective, notes are like a database. Uh, you can customize the way you view and navigate uh, the to-do items, and you should be very, be very flexible about this. Uh, context, you can capture notes from your emails, from a file, from a URL. Uh, we have modules on Firefox and Chromium to be able to keep notes within org files. Uh, documents are live documents. Uh, literate programming is implemented because you can evaluate code from your documents and sharing. Uh, you can export your documents in multiple formats. So when you combine org files with Git, for example, sharing these files with someone else, then you have the flexibility of this uh, uh, very minimalistic format, and the powerness, the, the 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 power of Emacs to edit it very fluently, and a, a, an easy way to share and to uh, have a conversation with others based on your uh, structured file. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan, for organizing all of this and inviting me to the talk. Um, today, I I thought um, to riff on. Um, your intro in um, your int in invitation email, where you mentioned the sentence, how our future note-taking infrastructure can serve us wherever we are as constant companions. And here it became clear that the reality of right now is that our workflows change over time. Um, so our apps and services change over time too. And so it's really also that our companions change. And in the whole like problem of interoperability, um, what we see is that the current landscape makes it very difficult to migrate between services or integrate between all of them. And this goes also to the heart of our shared concerns about interoperability and data portability between the services um, that we use every day and also between the services that are like where the founders and team members are right now um, are present in this call. And we also know all how tough interoperability is. So standards need to be developed, adopted, but also, also most importantly, they need to be updated over time. And that last part is actually also one of the more tricky ones. And it represents a massive coordination problem between the actors of an ecosystem. Um, it's one of the reasons why HTTP is still on version two after um, 30 years. And, but ultimately, uh, interoperability is a UX problem. So the question is, how can users integrate their current tools with other tools they use and easily migrate? Um, and the goal here is, um, how do you stay in the flow without interruptions? And these interruptions can come in the form of copy pasting stuff around, data migrations, et cetera. <clears throat> so that's the reason, sorry. <clears throat> so that's the reason why this talk is called In the Flow. <clears throat> sorry. And um, how do we solve this problem with, um, uh, bespoke interoperability. And what I mean with this is if we look at um, 
the interoperability as a UX challenge with the goal of increased flow states. Uh, there may be steps that tool builders can take that do not require uh, large scale coordination and that already brings large benefits to users and in the long run create more interoperability in the network overall. And I found it very helpful to think about uh, the context of the tool you're building. So what's the workflows that span beyond your tool? Which other tools do users use where an integration has outsized effect? And myself, I'm the founder of an open source software called Memex, and it's a tool to collaboratively curate, search, annotate, and discuss web content, such as websites, PDFs, YouTube videos, and soon also images. And in the context of, the, of Memex, we have identified that the larger workflow is what we call the creator workflow. And it's a loop of content discovery. You see here on the top right, uh, capture, synthesis, um, and then sharing. And those happen all in very, very different tools. And they're all interconnected in those workflows. So when we thought about this problem, it was the question, how can Memex strategically provide integrations to key tools and workflows in this loop? So for example, in the capturing step, we enable uh, importing of HTML files and your browsing history. Um, but we also have a copy paster that allows people um, to search everything they saved and then define a custom template on how to copy paste content from Memex into other applications. Say for example, a list of all of the websites that you have curated for a specific topic. Uh, you can do that with two clicks and you have it in Rome or Notion or whatever application you use to further synthesize your thoughts. Um, Memex also integrates with Readwise um, so that people can collect their annotations into one single place from multiple sources. Uh, it's what Dan also described is that becomes a very powerful use case right now, specifically for power users that use uh, tools like Rome Notion or Evernote. Um, then we also have a read API for all of the shared collections so that curators can integrate their curations into other applications. And then people can subscribe to those as RSS feeds later. Uh, that's not there yet, though. And so here's an example, for example, on how Culture Hack, uh, it's a, they built an editor to, to write blog posts about cultural change, um, has integrated the Memex collections into their editor to quickly reference annotations and pages they collaboratively saved and curated. Um, and that's, that worked via our read API that we developed um, for, and in, in beginning now, uh, for uh, like trusted partners that want to uh, integrate Memex data and trial it with us. So yeah, uh, these all are making Memex more interoperable without the need to adhere to many standards or coordinate with too many actors. Some of those integrations are more bespoke than others, um, though the key is that uh, it's small steps that can be taken to make data more accessible over time and so that more use standards can be tacked on or um, new ones can emerge. For example, um, for example, the work we did for the Readwise integration, we can use for a direct Rome integration later, or our read-only read API can be used to make the RSS feed possible. A great example for a, uh, an emergent interoperability is the double brackets that Rome, Obsidian, Notion, and many others are starting to use, and we're adding this to our editor later too. And with this, uh, we don't even try to adhere to defined standards that many um, it, that, uh, we don't try to adhere to the fine standards that many tools not even adhere to, but that the most important tools in our network do. And so it's very likely that this becomes a very like default syntax uh, in many other tools that currently may not even think about uh, what bidirectional linking means or uh, what concept tagging, et cetera. And to get there, we didn't need any central coordination. So no standard was needed to be defined, just a bunch of tools that saw the benefit um, of that syntax. Admittedly, for annotations, it's a bit more tricky to harmonize them since they're not just concepts or pure data. They also belong to an author, which has currently their identity tied to a specific service. So the easiest interoperability may be enabling an import-export in an open annotation data model, whereas the tricky part is making annotations accessible and synced across different services. And for that, I don't really have a good solution yet. So historically, interoperability was seen as a potential decremental a decrement or dec potentially decremental for a service because you may be able to lose users to competitors more easily. I think this is currently changing. 
uh, tools and consumers realize that there's an enormous advantage of building interoperable tools. Um, and this is because there's an infinite amount of custom workflows that people have. No single tools will, will serve that. Workflows evolve too. So users really want adaptability of their workflows. They want custom integrations to their favorite tools. Uh, they want to migrate easily to tools that serve their needs better. So I feel for, for tool builders that are serious about building useful software, interoperability can actually be a huge boon uh, to their success. Um, it'll make it easier to acquire users. It will make it easier to help users embed your own tool in their workflows. Um, you may be also losing some users, but that's okay, I guess, because it'll create sustainable pressure to you, for you to focus on an audience well and build really, really useful services for them. And if you do that, they also won't leave as easily. Um, so I think the future of note-taking will be a highly fragmented, yet interwoven network of tools services and paradigms that cover these infinite co amount of combinatory possibilities. And so bespoke interoperability may help us to overcome this coordination paralysis that we often experience. And yeah, we can take the first step in meshing together and then see where more coordinated interoperability is necessary without over-engineering a top-down model from the start. Oliver, thank you. Thanks. And I really want to pick up um, where Oliver left off here. Um, my thoughts um, are um, actually very similar um, in some ways. Um, and, uh, and mine are really center around a, a small feature request. Um, and and my kind of view of this ecosystem um, is um, moving from the edge, the edge being kind of where you are in the margin of a book, where you might be annotating, to the map, um, where uh, you might be um, uh, doing your kind of thinking and reflecting, planning, organization, writing, list making, um, to kind of higher order functions, calendar and coordinating, task management, and so forth. Um, and the different apps that are out there kind of fall in this um, spectrum um, of focusing more to, to a greater or lesser degree in part of that spectrum. And of course, it's highly overlapping. Um, some of uh, the features and functionality, for instance, in org mode have a lot to do with basic note taking, but also include those higher order functions as well. Um, for the purposes of my feature request, though, I want to look at just the edge and the map and the problem that kind of exists um, between these two. Um, because if you're out there annotating um, and um, you know, the awareness of your, your notes, your topic map or the other aspects of your kind of your PKM, your personal acknowledgement system is really limited to the home app that you tend to keep that stuff in. Um, you can import from, say, Hypothesis to another app, but it's a pretty crude one-way trip um, that only moves um, you know, upstream from left to right. So if you're in the margin of, for instance, a document and taking a note here on a Wikipedia article about personal knowledge management, um, you can um, take that note and save it. Um, and in this example, maybe use ReadWise. Um, uh, bless your heart, uh, Daniel, to take those notes from Hypothesis and move them into Rome. But what you can't do um, is um, in your in the annotation editor is double start double bracketing the word note taking and have it reference um, the your all the other notes in your kind of topic map that you've already created. Um, and I think you know this is. Well, a lot of folks work around that by just double bracketing the word, um, creating essentially what is a markdown link and just importing it into the knowledge management system um, where they'll use it there. And then in that system, once imported, it will naturally refer to the rest of the topic maps. But of course you get some, you lose a, some key features um, in, in that trip. Um, so if you were, for instance, to start the process of taking um, that 
to making that link, you would lose um, the process of, uh, you know, the, the auto suggest um, knowing that you, you know, what those um, links are that are in your knowledge base, um, catching any misspellings that you might be making, and, the, and, and just the, the easy process of being able to start and tab to this, the, the response that you want. Um, you may also want to um, know which one of your notes, if you were using something like the Agora, which one of your notes is a personal note that's only available to you versus which one of your notes is a public note that you use as a way to create um, uh, some topics that um, other that you're kind of sharing for the community, uh, potentially even for their collaboration and their input wiki style. Um, and you might even kind of extend the notion further to where you could be subscribed to mul multiple PKMs at the same time, not only your own, but also somebody else's or even public um, kind of wiki based systems like Wikipedia and um, um, you know, so you could choose whichever, you know, whichever one you wanted and only subscribe to the ones that you want to rapidly autocomplete. Um, and in this way, you could almost imagine this as a, as a form of kind of controlled vocabulary um, tagging um, that, um, that the user would be completely in control of. Um, so I think um, what might be needed for, so that would kind of blend the edges between systems. You'd have your knowledge map, your knowledge topic with it, with you wherever you go, no matter what app you're using. Um, and um, But it needs a few things. Um, needs a kind of a commitment uh, within the ecosystem to interoperate, um, a protocol um, in terms of how to request um, things, some pretty fast APIs if you're doing type, uh, type ahead and auto-suggest, um, some, some perhaps conventions for referencing uh, different PKMs if we're in a kind of a a multi-knowledge base world, um, and then of course services and clients uh, to implement all that. So that's my uh, that's my bit. Um, and let me go ahead and um, kick it over to Connor. Yep. Great. Awesome. Um, so I'm just going to actually be presenting out of my room um, or the the company room that we're using, um, and. Uh, it was interesting seeing the prompt of uh, sort of like what's the future of Rome and thinking about the future of note taking. Um, and so I uh, figured I would title the talk um, Rome is not about note taking. Um, and yeah, you know, start from the perspective that we've never really been about notes, which is kind of strange because uh, if you look at our landing page, um, it says Rome is a note taking tool for network thought. Now, this is a landing page that we also haven't updated in. Uh, yeah, you know, since October 12th, 2019. Um, but uh, I, what I'm gonna talk about is what Rome's sort of long-term vision always has been and um, why note-taking has sort of been the, um, the entry point. And we use, we use language that people are familiar with um, rather than introduce two new ideas. We, we uh, connected to something that was familiar with something that was new. Um, and it, it seems to be, um, it, it's gotten us Somewhere nice. Um, so Rome is always the goal of, of Rome. I've been working on Rome. Uh, I've been working on the problem since uh, 2008. Um, and uh, well, um, make that a slightly bigger. Um, but Rome is always, but I've been working on Rome as a company um, full time ish since um, 2013. Um, and our goal has always been to build a platform for collective intelligence. Um, this slide right here um, is the one I saw in like, yeah, 2000, 2008-ish, um, which is, this is this is Moore's Law, and it's sort of a stand-in for just um, the exponential increasing leverage that technology has given us over like our physical environment. Um, and my concern at that time was that like all of our sense-making institutions, this is too small an image, but, um, you know, whether it's our, our print, uh, our, you know, journal system, our um, systems of government, they were mostly designed in an era of, uh, you know, like print, um, print media and, uh, or, or the, you know, or broadcast media um, and had a, 
they they have been getting worse and worse, and it, it sort of looked like an inevitability for me that they would not be able to keep up with rapidly changing environment. Um, this is, and I think this year, this has particularly um, become obvious to folks if you look at sort of the uh, dramatic reversals and the difficulty that we seem to have in terms of building a truth-seeking or a sense-making um, society um, uh, and the ways that's that's been impacting our culture with sort of like the politicization of um, of everything, including, including science right now. Um, but... I had some, uh, I had a lot of hope. Um, I still have a lot of hope, um, you know, stemming back from uh, from 2008 or so. Um, this is the Great Pyramid of Khufu at, at Giza. Um, and I put a little um, interactive model in here. Um, so you could, you know, say that maybe all of the workers um, who worked on Khufu worked 10 hours a day. Maybe they worked, you know, 12 hours a day. It's kind of backbreaking labor, but maybe they were able to to do it, um, and um, yeah, uh, what I, yeah, we've got, um, let's say they did, uh, yeah. um, but if you took the, there's about, uh, YouTube was, was bragging about how there's about a billion hours of ads watched on YouTube um, every day, and so my initial interest in getting involved in the internet at all um, was, figuring out how you could um, like tap into that cognitive surplus because you know every day and a half um, like we are we're putting as much energy as the total man hours that went into to building that pyramid um, and I had been particularly motivated by uh, Clay Shirky and, and Yokai Bankler and um, the idea of common space peer production and that there were many potential Wikipedias left to be created I do want to um, like shout out Ward while he's here um, uh, and I can I can go into this in the future, but Federated Wikis have been in some ways even more inspiring um, uh, than than Wikipedia itself. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, I'll fly through the history, but basically from 2008 until 2011, I um, worked on trying to build a, a collective intelligence and a collective action platform that was based on local governments. Um, it was cool for like getting invited to the White House, and you know. Like honored by Obama, but like the reality was that it was a complete tire fire um, because we were trying to uh, one. I was 19, and um, we were trying to both figure out how to create a user interface for um, like really crowdsourcing uh, and and extracting tacit knowledge and organizing knowledge from a ton of different people in a community um, and directly channeling that into a um, into the political arena. And we had focused on local government because we had hoped that that area would be less um, prone to like the hyper partisanship or people intentionally misrepresenting each other's positions or just um, sort of uh, willful misunderstanding or, or sort of uh, narrative preselection of stuff. Um, but it's, it was I found it to be just as bad as as a, a national um, discourse. Ironically, we ended up getting acquired by AOL. Um, which only confirmed for me that like um, a lot of our media institutions are not necessarily interested in finding like the nuance uh, or like novel position, especially if there's a way in which the like incentive landscape allows them to score a ton of points against um, a perceived enemy. So um, this is a, um, an image I love um, around, you know, uh, one of the things that made it really hard running that first company was that there were so many hypotheses where we could be wrong. And um, there were so many uh, places where, you know, in order to solve one problem, we created a ton more. And um, and I realized that, you know, I'd not been uh, approaching it sort of scientifically. Um, so uh, from, you know, 20, you know, a after, after that acquisition, I was interested in how do you simplify the problem and basically take something from, you know, if, you're, if your goal is something massive, like try to figure out how to, uh, build a better sense-making system and a better way for people to um, learn from one another and, you know, update on complex ideas. Um, what's the easiest way to start? And I was interested in, you know, uh, flywheels, flywheel, flywheels and feedback loops, you know, focusing on something that um, was small enough that we could get off the ground and then, um, uh, you know, be able to progressively um, extend our reach. And so, um, 
one way of thinking about it, and this is the approach that Rome ended up taking. We get a lot of criticism right now um, for the fact that we, you know, charge 15 bucks a month, but uh, Rome was essentially unfundable for years. Um, people didn't think there was any uh, any possibility that you could build a, uh, a business in the, the knowledge management space, especially not with something as weird as a like graph based outliner. Um, so we couldn't really raise venture funding or uh, investment. Um, our initial go to market was focusing on, and I, I do want to challenge Ward's supposition that like a business model means that the incentives are not aligned between people. Um, our way of getting funding off the ground was uh, we were able to piece together from a bunch of different sources, um, uh, like um, the idea, we were able to convince some funders um, in the like effective altruism research space that there was some plausible chance that Rome could make their researchers, you know, two to 10% more effective. And if it's a, a space where, you know, there's, yeah, in that case, there weren't a ton of um, uh, math PhDs who were, you know, um, interested in like a, a certain kind of um, applied philosophy approach to um, uh, it's AI alignment and, you know, um, AI safety. Um, we, st we, we bootstrapped the company for a few years, um, just, you know, keeping it open for um, a, like a, a dozen to two dozen people. Um, and so this is this is currently the stage where I would say we're at. Um, we we iterated around that and took a, a big leap about a year and a half ago um, to open it up to the public, um, and you know made a decision to um, to charge a fair amount. Even though like currently about a th uh, about a third of our users are either on a free or discounted plan, um, but what Rome uh, made a, a conscious decision to. Um, you know, we, we expect that we are at the very earliest stages of um, the problem of trying to figure out how to enable many to many communication and um, building a real hypermedia tool for um, for representing thought. I'm going to get into that. But um, but yeah, currently for the last year or so, the main thing we've been focused on is sort of how do you um, how do we internally um, use the tool to think better together so that as we add more people to the team, we are not overrun with coordination costs. Um, currently we are uh, about a dozen people on six continents and, um, and that can be pretty tricky um, uh, because you don't have uh, a lot of the, the advantages of in-person coordination. And so, you know, the goal for Rome is to figure out how can we construct hey, something that's better than plain text, um, like better than, than prose essentially. <laughs> Um, for allowing uh, module like um, allowing a, um, extremely remixable, extremely reusable, and like um, uh, robust collaborative knowledge work, so you can get into a situation of um, you know uh, serendipitous collaboration, uh, one might say, or like. Um, yeah, um, how can you like how can you get some of the dynamics we have in open source, but in all sorts of other domains? Um, uh, and particularly, the thing that we're really interested in is, you know, can we um, can we figure out how to efficiently allocate expert attention so that you know the person who's who has the key insight can have hooks into um, into the work that other people are doing, and you know focus on just the part that is relevant for them, but still be able to bring in all the relevant context that's necessary. Um, and uh, um, and through that, um, you know, like be able to have a, a highly leveraged contribution and eventually be able to bring in a larger, um, more cognitively diverse, different skilled group of, um, uh, group of people. Uh, mine will be a short one because uh, this whole um, collaborative annotation idea is uh, pretty new to me and uh, to the logsec team. Although we have, we do share some uh, similarities in our visions. So uh, my talk will mostly be a um, brief introduction to what we do, and uh, mostly I will um, listen to the ideas from this panel. So my name is Jun Yu, and uh, I'm from the logsec team. In case you don't know, Logsec is a um, privacy first open source platform for knowledge management and uh, collaboration. 
it starts as a personal um, project uh, from our founder, Tianshen, and uh, it draws, draws many inspiration from other tools. For example, uh, Rome Research. So we, we thanks for all the great tools that uh, we learn from. And uh, we think in this age of uh, information explosion, and we try to build a tool that help users manage their knowledge more easily in the form of connected graphs instead of uh, just a standalone content. What's more, to make the user the sole owner of their data. And we put privacy and the data security at the most important position by utilizing encryption, embracing an open source method, open standards, and enforcing data security in all aspects. We chose the open source way because we believe not only it uh, improves transparency and encourages participation, but also it makes a tool for knowledge to everyone as it should be. We have a long way to fulfill this vision, but so far the story looks pretty good. Although it begins as a humble personal project from our founder, Logsec already have a pretty vibrant user base and a welcoming community. And the app, the web app and the desktop app have recently went through a core refactory, resulting in a much better architecture and uh, user experience. And we also just launched the early access for our plugin API, and the users are starting to build amazing plugins with it. And finally, we think Logsix vision aligns with uh, the um, collaborative and you know, collaborative knowledge management ecosystem in large. We all understand the importance of open standards and fully embrace them. And we aim to build not only better tools to manage knowledge, but also a better platform where people around the world can share and collaborate and build communities around it. And uh, by listening to the previous talks uh, from this great panels, I, mm, in my previous experience, I think this is a problem mainly unsolved. For example, the interruptive interoperability between different, you know, note-taking apps. But uh, af after listening to your talks, I start to think that that this is a problem we do can solve together you know, by embracing open standards and uh, build upon it. Yeah. So that's all for my talk. Junior, thanks. So I'll kick it off with, a, with one question, um, which I call the, the kind of the 25 year question. Um, 25 years being a um, a long time, not a crazy long time, but maybe a sufficiently long time that um, technologies that are kind of well conceived and durable um, tend to last. Um, the web passes the 25 year test. I think Ward's wiki is got a couple of years to go, but it's getting close. Um, and so if we think about note-taking, kind of the future of note-taking in the concept of the 25-year test, um, what are, what, what's most important to think about um, in either terms of features or, or capabilities or properties? Um, so um, I'll, I'll toss it out there um, for anybody that wants to kind of raise their hand and jump in. Oliver, do you want to kick it off? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I'm I'm not sure on a on a like technical level what will be needed, um, but I assume that if 
like a 25 year mark who wants to be hit by any product, um, it requires a significant sustained effort um, over that period of time um, to work on this. And uh, I know, for example, Connor uh, has a very strong, like voc is very vocal about his uh, like 25 year plans. Um, similar to mine is like to, to, fig to figure out what's the core purpose that drives you to build a product that can then solve a problem that will only be solved solvable in 25 years. Like um, for example, um, um, we both described this need of uh, our society to uh, solve the sense-making and decision-making crisis that we have. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't solve this in the next 25 years, the chances that we're surviving the century uh, or thriving beyond the century are, are limited. And um, uh, I don't want to be in a Mad Max scenario. I want to be in a Star Trek scenario. And um, so one part is definitely a strong vision on where things should go. And then an, an, an ability of the infrastructure and the product to iterate towards this um, and be adaptable to the changing environment that 10 years from now will provide or 20 years from now or 30 years from now. Um, yeah. Uh, Connor. So the, the premise is like, I'm curious what's motivating the question. Like, um, or sort of like, th there seems to be an unspoken assumption in there that like, um, that uh, so the web and wiki technology are 25 years old and that, can you, can you just say a little more, Dan, around? Context? I mean, what, what will define the note-taking apps that we use in 25 years, I guess, maybe is a, another way. I mean, what, what is most important, uh, another way to put it is what's most important about what we're about to build um, what do we need to focus on in order to provide really durable, lasting value for people to organize their thinking and collaborate with others? So it sounds like for you, there's a uh, like a um, like durability is an interesting. Um, it's an interesting idea because the thing that like this this problem is. Uh, you know, we're all we're all sort of following off of the end of our Bush's Memex in a sense, right? And like, you know, from him, Engelbart's, uh, you know, like, um, uh, yeah, like the mother of all demos, and like, there's a, you know, the original idea for how to how to deal with the crisis of um, information overwhelm and the fact that, you know, this the knowledge needed to organize our or to run our civilization was something that no one individual could possess. And the like, you know, expertise was becoming so siloed, it was hard to um, have a, a good understanding of, of more complex systems. I mean, the original pitch was microfilm, like that would be pretty durable um, if we still had material for reading microfilm, but like how durable are VHS tapes either right now, right? So um, like the, I, I think, I, I sort of want to say something like the, um, uh, I'm reminded of, of, um, of, a essay from Brett, um, uh, the web of Alexandria. And it was just pointing out like the most durable knowledge storage thing that, it, that we know of um, is DNA, which is constantly replicating itself and propagating and like, um, you know, and is, is you know, the, the information itself is undergoing change. Um, so, you know, our first feature when we opened up to the general public was uh, export to plain text as Markdown, export as JSON so it could be machine readable and like manipulable by other people. Um, and I, uh, I hope that is one of the reasons that um, you know, people were able to get a, a head start on uh, um, you know, like sort of open source alternatives and other ways. Like the, the nice thing now is that there's many ways. Originally, people were concerned about starting to use Rome because they were concerned about data lock-in, but now there's a half dozen different things that can read that Rome data. Um, but we started with the perspective of like, if we figure out how to solve the problem well and represent the ideas better than you can represent them in text, um, then like it will like, uh, it, other people will want to um, have their own way of reading that data. So yeah, I mean, uh, memory diamonds. I don't know if like the internet shuts down, we're fucked. So like, um, like that's, uh, um, like there's a lot of things that could 
they could make things really a lot worse. So like durability is in it, like, I, I can't get a notification if a, a paper that I read five years ago is falsified. That's the thing that makes me feel like the whole infrastructure we have of, of knowledge is completely not durable. Um, like our, our, our journal system is not durable. Like uh, the Library of Congress, I think 30% of links within five years are dead. So like, I think the distributed web gives us a bunch of hope. I think that there's a lot of um, like Ward's Federated Wiki, the idea that like when you, when you copy something, um, you uh, you make a local copy of your own. Um, I think there's there's a lot of approaches that are better than just a centralized server system. We happen to have started with a centralized server system because the hardest part for us to figure out is the UX of of how the um, the collaboration actually works. And you know we haven't yet figured out how to visualize version control. But like um, but really the like the end is going to be it has to be decentralized. So that's my that's my answer. Great. I'd, I'd like to add to that that. Uh, you know, certainly decentralization and, and, you know, JSON is nice because the claim it isn't going to be versioned. Uh, the, the, the thing that we really tried to tackle is this idea that you would actually do work in the wiki instead of just talk about the work. So we wanted to have some way to, to bundle uh, data and computation in a way that could persist longer than the implementation technology that we choose. And, and so we don't call it a domain specific language. I think that DSL has been abused, but, but we call it markup. We just say different types of things have different markups. And then we check and see how simple we can make that markup yep. and still get work done because we know we're going to end up re-implementing it over and over and over again. So to, to, to keep that one step of isolation from the underlying technology, it will be digital. I think we can be pretty sure, and you can probably represent integers, but it might not be IEEE floating point. Wait, I, I do, I do. This is give me a, a point that I kind of want to raise. I, I'm reminded of um, uh, Ted Nelson's eulogy for Doug Engelbart, where he said, um, "I honor Doug's legacy by keeping the links outside the file as Doug did." And there was, I was. It was interesting who wasn't included in this. Um, like, there's a, a project called Codex Editor um, that I think is doing really interesting things with standoff notation. Like, we we started with uh, like an embedded markup, um, but it's so not the right way. Like, it's that was for for pragmatic reasons of um, you know what we could what we could ship. Um, I do think the future is going to be in standoff notation. I think that like, that's maybe a, a bold claim, but like. Um, I think that keeping links outside the file is pretty essential if you're going to do collaborative stuff. Let's um, jump to Junyu. Yeah. Um, I think um, predicting the future is always hard, but we can learn, at least to learn from history. Uh, for me, um, um, we can, for example, for example, we can learn from the web, you know, after all these years, the web is still around, although it also has some challenges of its own. So um, why is web still around? And uh, reasons, there are many reasons. For example, it's it's open, it's, and it's accessible to everyone. And also as a platform, it may change. For example, we may have uh, better browsers, um, different, um, network protocols, but the content itself is always there. So that's one of my take. And also, mm, I just saw in the chats, someone says that uh, mm, the note taking applications will always change, you know, it will, but the data itself, the note itself, will be around for a long time and but uh, it takes it takes effort to make it dur durable yeah so that's all i can think about right now thanks uh bastian <clears throat> yeah i uh, just one idea i think git uh, has been uh, quite a change for all the developers uh it's going to be 25 years in 10 years and um, less than that in four years now. No, like nine years. 
And um, I think versioning will be pervasive into or no taking tools in 10 years. And perhaps Git is the right infrastructure for that. I mean, we will use it without noticing uh, by using online note taking. And I think this will bring uh, a lot of uh, uh, interoper interoperability into uh, the things uh, we do the same way. It has changed the way uh, developers can share code. So I'm not sure yet all the consequences for this uh, change, but I see it coming and I see it as a structural change for uh, collaboration and knowledge sharing. Thanks, Bastian. Uh, Eduardo. Thank you. Um, I mean, I want to add um, uh, to the amazing comments so far, uh, perhaps another perspective. I think that um, a very interesting sub problem that needs to be considered in this, uh, for this question that is. Uh, it's a great question, by the way. Uh, is that of the, the seeding problem, the bootstrapping problem? And essentially what, uh, what I mean by this is like uh, the responsibility we have as those potentially towards the beginning of a 25 year uh, long process, right? So, so here I think about uh, uh, things like inclusivity and diversity, right? Uh, so making this, uh, making sure that the system we build, the systems we are building, are as inclusive and, uh, and, and diverse and available as possible. And this is where the words uh, of, um, uh, of several of the speakers really resonate with me. Uh, so that's uh, like you knew. So, you know, having something that can be used by all the people and that we know that uh, we will be able to be used by all the people in 25 years, right? So essentially what legacy we are leaving uh, with the architectural decisions we are uh, taking and also uh, with the actual seeding of the knowledge and the seeding of the knowledge and the setting by example uh, we are doing by being the first, you know, the relatively first few users of the systems. So this I think is very important. Um, I, I personally like to think that um, it, whatever takes the place of this system, you know, I, as you know, I call it the Agora, but I don't want to impose on the name, but you know, like this, this commons we're building, this knowledge commons. Uh, whatever takes the place of that, I hope that in 25 years time, I will say a 13 year old or 15 year old with uh, plenty of time and interest should be able not only to use clearly for free, what we are saying, but also re-implement. That would be my, my wish. Uh, someone that you know can just uh, that knows a bit of programming and has an interest should be able to get and 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 tap on to these like vast knowledge commons that uh, I hope we are building today. Uh, Thanks, Alberto. Um, Dana, are you back? Uh, maybe. Yeah. Can you hear yep. me? Yep. Awesome. Um, yeah. So I'm probably the least qualified person to opine on um, you know super long term visions on where note taking is headed given that uh, we're focused the least on that uh, but uh, I, what we always talk about is uh, note taking right now typically takes place within an app so you have to context switch from whatever it is you're doing to take your notes and so we imagine in the future note taking will be more integrated at either the the browser or the operating system level and in this way the notes will be much more um, tied to um, the actual context you're in. That's definitely the, the vision uh, we see. You know, for our use case of reading, we definitely want to help people take notes better while reading, as one example, as opposed to having to have a separate note-taking app or a physical notebook open uh, while reading. Uh, thanks. Did I miss anybody? Oliver, did you go already? <laughs> Yeah, I did, but I have actually one more thought about it, and um, I think um, I think it was uh, Eduardo who st who mentioned this um, uh, or parts of that. Um, I think in order to make these uh, systems resilient and survivable over time, uh, the whole topic of interoperability, which we talked about at length in, in the previous um, 
uh, like presentations and also the introduction of this session was spiked with with the, this topic overall is if we if we build interoperable systems then it it means that knowledge has a continuation that that actually can be executed because of course uh, knowledge that is in a note taking application that um, has a lock in is still there but it it does not it's it doesn't allow to take that knowledge into new systems that can gradually survive all of the extinction events that happen um, for each of those applications uh, as they become too old to serve the use cases of, of the users that they were in uh, intended to, to serve in the first place. Um, and if we see, for example, um, the internet um, as a interoperable system uh, has proved that to be right, right? Even though it's, it has its drawbacks, it, it's hard to update, but ultimately it survived until now over a 30 year period almost unchanged because it was built on the foundations of interoperability and meaning uh, you could move from one server to the other. You could still talk to everyone else. Um, so yeah, over time, um, if we, as a collective um, community of note-taking or like just generally tool makers, knowledge tool makers, keep uh, an, an, an intention to stay interoperable and make it easy for people to one, move to new services, and two, if they move to new services, have mm, at least as friction as is possible, although that's very, that's one of the hardest problems that we can solve, in, like communicate with people that use other tools. So an example that I, that I bring up, uh, up often is, why do we, do we have to uh, reinstall uh, and, and repopulate our entire social graph when we move from WhatsApp to Telegram? Why do we, why don't we, uh, why we're not able to talk to our WhatsApp friends that are not, that haven't changed at the service? And so, um, yeah, of course, this is going to be a hugely um, complicated problem to solve. But, um, uh, yeah. Uh, definitely. I, I would agree that's key. Yes. Uh, that's definitely key. And I will say that if in 25 years, uh, these people of the future, some of which we will ask, but not, not all of us, uh, cannot take their whole social networks together with all their data and just move platforms uh, with the uh, snap of a finger, we have failed. We have failed them. I think this is one of the biggest- Guys, 25 to... years ago, there were 20 million users of the internet period. There were no mobile phones. Like the level of pessimism on this, right? I'm like, are you guys not seriously trying to think about Neuralink and like, you know, room scale knowledge representations that are not verbal? Like, what the hell are we talking about with note taking? Even is it knowledge capture? Is it knowledge compression? And like, I, I think Connor, yeah, my, with, yeah. with, with, with all due respect, I think that what you point out is very interesting, right? I mean, of course, the media, the format, the resources that uh, people are going to share in the future. We, I want to think we can't imagine. If we could yeah. imagine them all, we will be living a boring future in twenty-five years. So I agree yeah. with you there that the formats and the media and the things being shared uh, will change. But I believe that. The basic problem, which has to do with power dynamics to some extent, I believe, uh, of like, who owns yeah. the data, who owns the data, who really can uh, make a claim on data and, and actually, uh, you know, like interrupt it, like Oliver was saying, that problem is sort of like orthogonal to the actual nature of the media. Yeah, you know, I want to uh, complain for a minute when we're talking about longevity and that when I ask people to put up a server, and share their content. And their content is unreadable because it's an HTTP. And there's some theater there about privacy, but I notice that every raping and plundering site is running HTTPS. You know, that, that basically means you're big and conglomerate and dangerous. And little people just putting up servers are denied access to this medium. So yeah. who thought that was a good idea? It used to be called breaking the internet. Mm. Okay, um, we, we've got uh, a couple, a bunch of great questions here in the Q&A, so let's move to the audience. Um, but one short, simple question that um, got a bunch of upvotes right away um, was, what, if any, role um, do you see AI taking in collaborative note-taking? And I, and I guess you can take it that any way you mean it. Um, you could in terms of AI in the formation and creation of notes or AI in terms of its a, the ability for AIs to reason over the co collective collaborative knowledge that we're all creating. 
Um, anybody want to jump on that one? Uh, clearly a, an opportunity there in translation. You know, it's proven to be effective, even if humorous on occasion. Uh, I'd be very suspicious of depending too heavily on any individual's artificial intelligence uh, for fear of, of you know, uh, uh, you know the 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 uh, biases that are intrinsic in anything done statistically. Anybody else on that? Well, maybe some speculative idea. I think AI will be able to get <clears throat> to infer questions from the notes. Uh, most of the notes I take, for example, are just uh, information answers to question I ask myself. And uh, I think in, in as a Geopardy game uh, or as the uh, IBM Watson game, I think it's very useful to go back to the questions uh, for which we have the answers because we will have too many answers and too few questions. So I hope AI can help um, tackle this issue. Thanks, Sebastian. I will perhaps add shortly just two things. Like one is uh, to, uh, to, to word on, on translation. I'm looking forward to translation, not only of uh, natural languages, but also of like mental models, right? When I say X and you say Y, do we mean the same, the same thing, right? How to recognize those, uh, uh, those occasions or how to actually translate to be more intelligible. And, and the other thing is like, um, I'm also looking forward to the application of, of uh, essentially the latest techniques, uh, generative techniques that I can uh, create creativity, like transformer based models and so on to uh, node corpuses that are actually social. I actually, I'm a believer in the potential of uh, perhaps uh, training AIs together as groups, right? To perform functions and so on. But... All right, let's go to uh, one of the earlier questions um, from Chris Aldrich, uh, who says, um, I find it curious that we didn't hear much, if anything, about the rise of the bi-directional link, either within the wiki or ideas like Web mentioned that allow one knowledge base to communicate with another. Is it important as I think it is? Um, so um, uh, this is, you know, perhaps particularly relevant too in the in the notion of uh, uh, the coming future of federated open collaborative kind of personal knowledge management um, systems and how bi-directionality um, kind of plays in that future. Started off with Ward since you invented the bi-directional link. What do you think about all that? You know, I, I, uh, I don't think it's a hard problem as long as there's a will to make it happen. Uh, people who are creating things for a profit or advertising driven, they want to be sticky. And so the last thing they want to do is thing anywhere else. So overcoming that is the challenge. Uh, it doesn't have to be any more complicated than putting a recognizable code on every item in your notes and then scraping that together and building indices from that from the uh area the, the the realm of interest you know one problem is that you know with a bi-directional link you say what links here and it turns out it's ten thousand. you know and that doesn't help you want to say of the people i care about in the moment for the notes what 10 things link here and that you know needs to be expressed somehow to the context in which you're interested You got a hand clap from that. I saw it floating up the screen. Two hand claps. Well, I think those are for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody else? Yeah, um, I, um, Eduardo and Dan, we had a conversation, um, I think a couple of weeks ago, 
uh, that I found really interesting. And, and uh, you also riffed on it uh, in your short presentation. Uh, essentially, how, how do we make it possible for, for um, in the UX of, for example, uh, creating the double brackets that you, when you hook into, um, like when you create a double brackets that it does not just allow you to search inside what the current tool is, but all of the tools that are attached to it. So it means also you create those bi-directional links to multiple endpoints in the end. Like it can be Roam, it can be Notion, it can be Memex, it can be uh, Hypothesis, it can be Anagora. Like, and so um, uh, that that was that is for me one of the most uh, straightforward and powerful ways of making those tools more interoperable and making those tools interoperable around the user's need again to be interoperable like when you when you for example pull up um, the different connectors um, uh, then it's obviously yours like if you if you if you haven't hooked your own Rome graph uh, into it then you're not gonna get someone else's wrong, uh, then you're not going to get your wrong graph and you won't get anyone else's uh, wrong graph as a suggestion there if you haven't in some form connected to it. And again, this, this again plays into this uh, notion of how do we create a more user-centric um, interoperability that allows them to adapt their workflows more efficiently um, uh, without making this a mandatory experience um, uh, for, for, for everyone. Yeah, if I may, <clears throat> I think backlinks uh, will be the default uh, for every note-taking system, and uh, we don't have backlinks in org mode right now, but there is a tool called org roam, uh, which implements backlinks and that people enjoy very much. Uh, what I think resonates uh, with what Daniel uh, said previously, that for now we have apps and those apps are things that we need to open and we need to uh, take notes within the apps and it's not very well integrated within the system so uh, the whole problem of backlink and link consistency in general is about having the note taking process with uh, closer to the to the system and being able to make references to the world system in a more generic fashion uh, the secret weapon of org mode is that people tend to live in Emacs, so it's very well integrated with all the people uh, use every day, the file and even uh, browsing the web on, on Emacs. Or, so this kind of integration is very powerful and uh, yeah, uh, we are trying to think about how to get backlinks, but it always needs something that monitors the whole system and I think uh, the 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 when note taking will be closer to the system, then the tools we have to monitor uh, reference integrity will be available uh, more easily. So, so our experience in this was that when we had a uniform site maps, we added links to the site maps and in addition to pages, and then it becomes natural to say, if you're looking at five sites in one of our things, if that's your neighborhood, and you ask for backlinks, you'll get backlinks in those five sites. And it, it's computationally efficient, which is important to us because, you know, we're running on the user's computer. But uh, I think that, that and, and the point was made about externalizing links, but it doesn't have to, links don't have to be born externalized. They just have to be externalizable and uh, the context controllable. A common effect of ours is, is you'll be browsing along and there's a little counter in the bottom of how many pages are close at hand and it'll go from 100 to 1,000 to maybe 10,000. And when it gets up past 10,000, then all of a sudden, a lot of these things sort of start breaking down. You say, oh my God, I got two people, too many people in my neighborhood, just throw them all away and start over. And, you know, you're focused again. You know, it's a, it's a go away, don't bother me sort of effect, but it's, uh, it's very real. Thanks, Ward. Um, kind of 
gets back to another question that just came up. What are the drawbacks to bi-directional links? You, you kind of hinted at that a little bit, which is, of course, if they're too broad coming from too many sources, it is kind of a spammy um, um, environment. And so, um, you know, you really only want backlinks from the folks that you care about. Um, and But sometimes you don't know what you're going to care about. So um, there's a, almost a reputation, you know, kind of an awareness attention a dynamic that comes if the sim system expands too too large. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons maybe the the web didn't implement them, and you know, some people might think that's a good idea that it, that it never did. Um, um, any we're we're really a couple minutes from ending here. I think I'll just throw it open back to the panelists, and uh, if anybody wants to. To make uh, kind of a comment or an observation in closing, um, um, maybe even around interoperability. Uh, thank you. I will. I will shortly start it, uh, perhaps by saying that um, it, it is just my personal opinion and, 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 and that of uh, the people I work with uh, to do what we can to make it easy for people to uh, to adopt. Uh, uh, the Aura or essentially the, 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 the conventions that we are depending on, that we believe are essentially the, the cheapest ones we have, we know and the most generally usable. And if you point us in the direction of a better convention, we'll adopt it. And we actually plan to adopt as many conventions as, as it takes so that, you know, people in general, so because of the inclusivity aspect. So I just wanted to, I, I, guess, I, I guess, offer the uh, offer this offer to um, to essentially uh, work with you to reach uh, better standards, um, and of course, just like uh, I'll follow your way, right? Uh, because uh, you have been working on this for so for so long, many of you. Uh, so yeah, thank you for your time and uh, for letting me share this. Thanks, Aparo. Anybody else? Connor. Um, I'll go, I'll go last. I'll, I'll, I'll think. Okay. Um, anybody else want to jump in? A few words. In yeah. Closing. Uh, just a quick word. Thank you again. Uh, I think there is a burst of, uh, new solutions, new problems and, I very much appreciated the discussion and the attention paid to uh, the longevity of some solutions that we already have. And I think uh, the more uh, experimentation there is, uh, I, I've seen a lot of things that I want to explore now. Uh, the Memex looks great, uh, Readwise and, and all that stuff. So the more solutions we have, uh, the, the more discussions like this one we need to have. So thanks again. Welcome. So, Dan, are you going to invite us all next year to see where we got? <laughs> yeah, we'll, just, we'll 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 call it the the new the the new 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 future of uh, note taking. <laughs> um, just to well, thanks for bringing us together. Yeah, you're more than welcome. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. collected my thoughts for a second. Um, I, it is funny thinking about. It. I think the last time. I saw you, Dan, was at this conference maybe two years ago. Um, it's, a, it's been a crazy couple of years. Um, I like particularly want to shout out uh, or like have a thank you while I'm on the call with Bastion um, uh, because org mode was one of a few systems that I was using as a proto roam um, before I, you know, um, uh, that and Envault and, and a few others and um, toward because the um, conceptual model of the Federated Wiki and his sort of uh, thinking about um, dissent and you know the problems of like a sort of forced consensus um, was, were, were really really big for me. And then also, I mean, I don't want to like now now it looks bad who I don't name, but uh, um, <laughs> and then I, I, I should also shout out Daniel though because he gave me the How to Take Smart Notes um, book, uh, which uh, ended up really helping. I I had only. Zettelkasten had already been a big influence, but I did not realize somebody had written a book about it until Daniel gave it to me. And um, that uh, has been really important for our community. Um, I think the, 
uh, the curse of Xanadu is alive, you know, like you, like, and I think a lot of this, um, there's a lot of ways to focus on things that are not like core, I guess. Right. Um, uh, and, and not, and yeah, I, I think my, my main, my main thesis is like solve problems in the order that you have to solve them, um, in order to get a feedback loop going. I similarly was once a, like, um, you know, like everything must always be open source. I, I think there's probably a world where like Rome ends up being open source at some point. Um, but like, for me, there's a complexity budget and there's like, you know, you minimize the variables you've got and it's very possible for open source systems to end up with perverse incentives based on where their funding comes from and focusing on things that are not necessarily, um, uh, pushing the frontier. So, um, and yeah, I, I think that's my, my main point is that, um, right now we're still at such an exploratory space and the problem is so like there, there's, uh, like the problem is so weakly explored of how do we represent knowledge to ourselves and to others? And how do we figure out how to think better together? Um, that, you know, adding additional unnecessary constraints while you're trying to figure this out. I, I'm very happy that there's so many open source clones of Rome that are focused on interoperability, those things. Cause like if, if I, you know, screw this up, there will still be people who are building on, you know, the last five years of work. Um, but like, there's so, like so many problems that are still open. And if you simplify your system, sometimes imperfectly at first, right. Um, you can, you can, uh, you can have a chance at like figuring out what the solution might look like. So, um, you know, like the main, one of the main things you were mentioning, Dan, of like multiplayer backlinks, that's the problem that we're even working on, right? How do you, how do you figure out how to filter for that? Um, based on like users within your trust network, the internet didn't start with a social network built onto it. And like eventually, you know, adding decentralization and is, is a whole other layer on top of it, but, um, we'll see, you know, I'm, we're going to be working on this for a really long time. So it's just about the sequence of the problems. So nice. Mm -hmm. I can only echo this. Um, like we have been definitely victim of over optimization and idealism in the past and, um, made it very difficult for us to build a product that actually can provide the value it needs to. Um, yep. And, uh, so that that was also one of those insights or like one of those learnings that led to uh, the presentation I made before where you really, you don't need to be an idealistic interoperable product where you adhere to every standard that is available right now, which introduces a lot of complexity, slowness of iteration, et cetera, yeah. um, but rather go for these very particular interoperable integrations between the services that are crucial for your users to complete yeah. their workflows. And um, yeah, and ultimately, I feel this is this is maybe the commitment that uh, will be really helpful for all of us together is is understanding that the biggest blocker to collective intelligence right now is nevertheless non interoperability. It's 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 the inability to connect the knowledge across different sources of information and move information across different systems as the user evolves their own knowledge workflows and as the user is capable of executing um, uh, better technical implementations for the heuristics they have um, in, in, in processing information. And um, interoperability can certainly help. And but we don't need to be uh, I, idealistic about it. I've I've got to run everybody, but thank you guys so much. Thanks, Dan, for hosting. Um, Bye. And thank everybody. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, Connor. And Daniel, let me kick it. Over. Yeah, I mean, um, we've been in this space for about five years now, and it definitely feels like you know, as of a year or two ago, there was definitely an inflection point where it feels like. Um, there's a lot more innovation, a lot more people focused on this, a lot of, of people coming in. So it just feels like an exciting time um, to be working on these on these problems. We all call it note taking, but I imagine in the not too distant future, there'll be a different term um, for whatever this space is we're in. I'm not sure there is a, an agreed upon one yet. Um, you know, personal knowledge management or tools for thought or something like that. Um, but yeah, I appreciate being invited to this and, and being able to participate. It's, a lot of exciting times ahead. Indeed. Um, I think we've, was that everybody? Yeah. 
Um, well, thanks. I just want to say thanks to everybody for joining. Um, it, this was really um, a session I've been looking to, forward to for a while. Um, really appreciate you guys making time and for coming from all different time zones around the world. Um, Junyu had to drop off because it was probably three o'clock in the morning there or something. Um, but um, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys, um, you know, in this space, kind of making stuff together and uh, uh, look forward to, to more of it in the future. Um, so thank you all. Thanks um, to everybody in the audience.